A very good morning and welcome to Bloomberg UK, the special focus on the biggest challenges facing the British government, the economy and financial services and markets. I'm Manish Cranny in Dubai. Today, we're talking sticky inflation and what it means for the Bank of England. It is the highest and stickiest inflation in the G7. And this is what we have for you relative to Germany, relative to Italy uh, and in Spain, all the way around Europe. It now puts pressure on the Bank of England that, yes, the inflation numbers may well have receded from those double-digit highs. However, the issue is this. Are they going to have to do another jumbo rate hike? UK bonds are the worst performing bonds in the developed world. They're up 94 basis points this year. The swaps market is now solidly convinced that there is going to be another rate hike, and not just any old rate hike, but a jumbo rate hike. Now, there is one moment of solace. I give you the great British breakfast. Not a heart attack, just the input costs of the great British breakfast. It's actually fallen for the second time. Food inflation is easy. £35, 58p for a ingredient basket for the great British fry-up. I think that's darned expensive. Anyway, it's £3.66 higher than it was July of last year. Sausages, bacon, eggs, butter. What have we got? Coffee is down 6.6%. Milk, where are the sausages? The sausages are the ones that did it, up nearly 2%. Uh, as as uh, one, of the biggest, uh, one of the biggest retailers in the United Kingdom cuts their prices on 200 products. You cannot say that we do not bring you a full breadth and spectrum of what and how we understand inflation. The great British breakfast. Let's ask an American what she makes of it. From an Irish man to an American lady. Val, good morning. How are you doing? What do you make of the data this week? The Brits, they have a bigger inflation problem than the Yankees, haven't they? Good morning, Manus. Yeah, that's right. And it was confirmed this week that yet the UK still has a core inflation problem and it is not budging. The big thing on uh, Tuesday was that wage inflation number rising to a record high, Manus. And this is concerning for the Bank of England because wages really feed into services inflation. And that is exactly what we, what we got confirmed yesterday, that that services inflation component remains sticky. It is not falling. It has yet to really reduce trace even though headline inflation has fallen there is, was some good news more for the consumer this week uh, one of which you've mentioned food and prices food price inflation <laughs> has begun to fall as well as prices for consumer goods but maybe that is something for the UK consumer to cheer but for the Bank of England uh, they seriously have a core inflation problem with that core inflation number hardly budging from a near 7% year on year. I mean, look, if you thought that the Treasury had angst under the period of Liz Truss, guilt yields, the cost of funding the deficit, uh, et cetera, it is mounting. Those interest rate costs for the Brits and for many governments around the world are tough. But then, of course, they have monetary policy, which is independent. What is the specter of another 50 basis point hike, uh, Valerie? Because that has major implications, of course, for the funding and interest rate costs for government and, and, and government spending. Oh, no, that's an excellent uh, point, Manus. A lot of attention on the, the fiscal outlook uh, for the UK government, given these higher yields. And when it comes to that 50 basis point hike, we need to remember the last time Bailey surprised us with a 50 basis point hike, it was the exactly same recipe, hot wage inflation, hot core inflation that tempted him to do so. If we look at what the swaps market is pricing, we're pricing in around 30 basis points for that meeting come the end of September. So we are very much tempting another 50 basis point hike that that terminal rate expectation for the Bank of England is back around 6%, Manus. That could cause some headaches uh, for the UK government if they do uh, continue to spend like they have been. Uh, and then secondly, we need to remember, though, we have another raft of data before we get uh, to the Bank of England's meeting in September. We do get another inflation print and we do get another uh, jobs, uh, jobs print as well. Okay, well, there is that differential, isn't there, in the market? I mean, the, mar the market has a, has a rate of five and an eighth uh, for the beginning of next year. Um, Valerie, what is the next macro shoe to drop? 
Uh, good point, Manus. Tomorrow we get retail sales, which is going to be a good uh, gauge on the consumer that comes after that GDP number uh, last week. Really surprised on the upside, driven by consumption. So let's see if that strong retail sales tomorrow perhaps uh, confirms uh, a strong uh, consumer. Then next week, we also get the preliminary PMIs for July. will be interesting to see if we get a rebound in services after they have been weakening. And then there's Jackson Hole at the end of last week. We have yet to hear that Bailey is confirmed attendant. He did attend last year, and it will be nice to see him on that panel and hear his words uh, and juxtapose them to the other others there, uh, Powell, Lagarde, who have seen success on inflation, and, and see how he, uh, you know, attempts to um, uh, pitch that he is still on top of this inflation fight here in the UK. Yeah, and I've just made the, the classic mistake. I looked down, I looked at my dollar rates and not my sterling rates. Five and an eighth, we'd be lucky if that's what we were looking for uh, in January of next year in the United Kingdom. Uh, it's going to be squeezy, it's going to be tight, and it's certainly going to be more than five and an eighth is the current estimate uh, for the US. Valerie, thank you very much. Valerie Titel there. Uh, on the data for the UK, the UK economist, the house economist is Dan Hansen. He is our senior UK economist. Dan, good to see you. Um, you know, I heard the advisor to the Treasury yesterday on, I mean, they just keep peddling the same lines that we've had a war, we're in the middle of a war, we've had price caps. I mean, we are one year on. Energy is not as expensive as it was last year in terms of gas, etc. Where are we with the inflation conundrum in the UK? Good morning. Yeah, good morning, Manus. So I think... For us, at least, it's two issues that have impacted the UK. You've mentioned the energy price spike there, and actually that is coming off. I mean, one thing to mention here is that the UK has this quirky way of measuring inflation, um, energy prices and the way they enter the, the inflation basket. So it takes a bit longer for it to show up in the inflation basket. So that's one thing. And I think come October, it's quite likely we'll be down close to that 5% mark that everyone's talking about, particularly the government. The thing that's really been bothering particularly the Bank of England is the labour market. And you heard Valerie there talking about wage inflation, and it's going in completely the wrong direction at the moment. And what you've had is this interaction between very high inflation driven by high energy prices and workers, consumers, trying to in ensure that their real, income, real incomes aren't squeezed too much by that inflation and taking advantage of the fact that we're in a very, very tight labour market here in the UK. And that's what's driving that... What, central bankers call that second round effect that's what's pushing up core inflation and that's why we're seeing in the wage data still some very very high numbers and that's the thing that's going to continue to worry the bank as Valerie mentioned prior to, prior to this hit and yet ironically we talk about you know a real wage a positive real wage for the first time in a number of years it's hardly what you call it heartening when you're dealing with inflation at just under, what, just under 7%, and so you're supposed to sort of stand back and go, wow, I've got a real wage increase of 0.8% or whatever. Um, what do you think it means for Bailey? I mean, Valerie laid out the map. It's the toxic mix that took us through jumbo rate hikes before. Do you think that they would be so aggressive and do a jumbo, i.e. a 50 basis point hike in September? Yeah. Yeah, I mean, again, as you've said there, Valerie sort of mentioned that the market's beginning to look at that. I mean, it's the mix is similar that we had in the run-up to the June meeting. We've had these surprises, and particularly on the wage data. I'm not sure that the CPI data was a huge surprise to the bank. I mean, the headline number was in line with their forecast. Yeah. Services inflation was a little bit above what they were expecting, but not, not by much. I mean, I think we've got another raft of data coming, coming through, so that, that's going to be really important. But I think the bigger picture here is that if you go back to the August meeting, the bank did shift in its strategy. There's a little bit more emphasis now on the level of rates, not just the rate of change. And I think the idea particularly of going in May, remember we had 25, then we had that June 50, August we had 25, then to go back up to 50, it would look a little bit out of control to me. So I think the bank is now a little bit foc more focused on the level of rates, the restrictive uh, level of rates, and I think 25 basis points looks very likely in September. Um, for me, it, it's not going to be a 50, though. OK, Dan, thank you very much. That is Dan Hansen, our senior UK economist. Coming up, we take a look at that sticky inflation narrative. What does it mean for the latest retail sales figures out tomorrow? We'll check them in on Bloomberg.
Next week, Bloomberg is live from the annual Jackson Hole Economic Symposium. Our expert team speaks with Fed presidents and other economic leaders as they deliberate the shifting global economy. What is the response mechanism? It's not how fast we do it, it's where we go. What are we going to war? Coverage starts Wednesday, August 23rd with a special edition of Bloomberg Surveillance live from Jackson Hole on Friday, August 25th, starting at 8 a.m. Eastern. Bloomberg, your global business authority. The big picture is that both the, both the UK, UK, the US, and indeed the European economies have been much more resilient than anybody thought. And actually, there are lots of lags between policy. And raising interest rates is not causing unemployment. It's not causing wage, wages to, wage demands to, to go down. We're still seeing consumers who are very confident in, in spending. We all know inflation's a bit stickier than mm. we think it's going, going to be. But just, let's just assume it is a bit stickier than it's going to be and not set unrealistic expectations that it's going to be down to 2% by the end of the year. The ever bullish legal and general CEO Nigel Wilson there on the resilience of Economy UK. Now, we have yet to get more UK economic data this week. We're going to get the retail sales coming out tomorrow. Inflation is sticky. Uh, will this have an impact on the consumer spending. It's been wet, I understand, at home. Uh, Victoria Clark can attest to that. She's a Santander UK's chief economist. Victoria, good to see you. How will the rain pound retail sales? Good morning. Yeah, it, it certainly has been wet. I can attest to that, uh, having been you know, in London for, for a lot of uh, the, the wet start to August. In fact, the figures we're getting tomorrow are for July, and July was was the sixth wettest July on record. So this is, you know, undoubtedly going to be a big part of the of the retail sales story. So for us, we're looking for um, something like a one percent drop in retail sales on the month in July, and that's been pretty consistent with with hints that we've had that that the wet weather did dampen things like clo clothing store sales. And I think that you know it is going to be a story of the weather. Does that make me? more worried about the consumer backdrop no not really i think this really is a weather story and actually you know the story that we've learned over the last few months has been one of economic resilience do you think we can continue to be resilient given the wage inflation given the cpi i know that the trajectory and the trend of cpi is on the rollover i understand that but wage inflation now gives us the first real positive wage inflation for a number of years. Does that underpin the consumer and therefore underpin, you know, Team UK economy? Resilience has, has, has absolutely been, been the story and been the surprise for, for many UK economists th through this year. And I think that there's a couple of bits to that. One is the strength of the jobs mm. market. We've had, you know, we've had pretty strong pay growth as we saw in figures earlier this week which have pushed even higher and we've had strong hiring now you know i think these two things are, are super important to watch going forward and as you mentioned the fact that um, on some measures inflation headline inflation has crossed below pay growth is important so i think if hiring holds up well enough and i think the jobs market is turning a bit in the uk but it will do so slowly people still get pretty good pay increases and, and you, know, you know, that means that they will feel less of this inflationary squeeze. So, you know, there are reasons Are we in a wage spiral, that... Victoria? Are we in a wage spiral? I, I, I don't think we're in a wage spiral, but I think that there is more work to do f mm -hmm. for the interest rate rises because, you know, we're in this position where we've had really sticky core inflation and, you know, if the Bank of England okay. doesn't keep its foot on the pedal, it's going to, you know, it, it, it is going to end up in a problem where that inflation gets more and more embedded. So um, it's, it's a tricky If you had a seat round that table, would you be voting for 50 basis points? If you had a seat round that table, would you, would you unequivocally say, Governor, 50 basis points, look large at the next meeting? No, I, I, I think still looking at, at the data, just pressing on, keeping sending that tightening message is probably the right thing to do. So, you know, for me, 25 basis points is probably the right balance for the next meeting. I think that's what they'll do. Um, 
but you know they need to keep sending that message and so in a sense you know pressing on with 25 and another 25 in November when pay is still going to be high keeps the focus on the fact that they have this you know this this laser focus on mm. the fact that they've got that sticky inflation so here's the conundrum, isn't it? I'm looking at the gilt yields in the United Kingdom, the highest since 2008. Now, globally, bond markets are selling off and you've got 15 year highs around the world. However, British government bond yields are now higher than they were under that moment, that anaphylactic moment of confidence and shock under Liz Truss and Kwasi Kwarteng. That says to me this bond market trusts this administration less than that administration, because I look around the rest of the world, I've got 4.2% in the United States of America. I've got 3.2% in France. The bond market is savaging the British government bond. What's the risk here of a strike, a, a, a buyer strike in British government bonds? I mean, I, I think the, the point that, that we have to consider for the UK is that, you know, it's been on, on a hell of a journey since the back end of last year where, you know, we've been understanding with each month of data that comes by that the UK has this particularly sticky inflation problem. And I think that that, you know, that that's super important, you know, you know, politics aside, it's, it's the inflation story and what that really means for UK interest rates. And we're trying to, you know, slowly understand what the new shape of the UK labour market is, what impact Brexit might have had on some of those structural inflation forces. And I think this is the story, you know, for the UK and, and, and what we're seeing in those yields. And so, you know, that that inflation battle is ever more important, looking at those yields and the need for the Bank of England to get a grip on it and get those inflation numbers down and get those rates down, which will, you know, which will all help the UK when it's looking at its, you know, short to medium term borrowing challenges. Yep. Listen, Victoria, I hear you, which is it's about sticky inflation, man, as it may not necessarily be to do with the administration confidence or lack thereof in it. But you, you can sort of see the sun headline, though, can't you? You can see the narrative that's going to be put down, uh, you know, coming from some of the houses uh, in terms of about confidence. Let's see where the inflation numbers go. Get out there. Get the suntan cream out, Victoria. It's going to be a beautiful <laughs> autumn. I have an assurity on that. Even in Ireland, they tell me the sun will shine. Victoria Clark, the UK uh, Chief Economist there for Santander. Coming up on the show. We're not out of the woods yet. We discuss what this inflation, this sticky toffee pudding of inflation means for the government and the Bank of England. We're going to talk mortgages in the UK on Blender. We're not out of the woods yet. We've got a long way to go and we've got to stick with the plan. I think inflation reached nearly 11% last year and while it's come down significantly from that point, it's really incumbent on the Treasury and this government to stick with the plan to make sure that we're making responsible public finance decisions and that we make sure that fiscal policies aligned uh, with monetary policy at our independent Bank of England will we'll continue to do that um, and we're certainly not complacent despite the significant reduction announced today. Gareth Davies from the UK Treasury there speaking to me after the data showed that inflation fell last month, but less than expected. For more on the UK inflation problem, I'm joined now by John Stepick. John, is the government's plan, I suppose, having a tangible impact or are there more systemic issues? I looked at those gilt yields. They're worse than under Liz Truss. But of course, it's not politics. It's sticky inflation, my friend. That's the problem. Yeah, I mean, this is it. the idea that I can see why the government wants to kind of, you know, uh, take the credit for this. But most of the drop in inflation is basically just it's just maths. Um, you know, last year it was extremely high and we had energy bills were the big driver. And the big driver that they dropped this time round is the fact that energy bills, uh, the way that the UK caps its energy bills is that every quarter it goes up or down and it just so happens that in this quarter it's gone down significantly and the last time it went up. We'll see something similar in October again. Um, I mean, you know, to be fair to the government, at least, I mean, it could be making things worse. Um, but, you know, it's getting out of the way and kind of basically leaving it all to the Bank of England and as much as the Bank of England can actually do anything. But yes, it's basically just maths. 
Now, let's talk about mortgages, uh, because this week we've had more data that is going to impact the mortgage rate. I, I think in the break we were laughing. I think I had my first mortgage in 1994, and it was pretty brutal. And I can remember thinking, I'll never get my money back out of this property. I'm looking at the actual zone where I lived. Um, yes, I would have got my money back. Let's just put it that way. Uh, I'm probably in plenty. But in 1994, I paid 7%. And I was quite cautious on the multiple that I took, even though I was a, a well-paid young banker. How's the mortgage market looking? I mean, the mortgage market itself is pretty healthy. Um, you know, banks want to lend. They've got the money to lend. Um, and in terms of, you know, we're not facing a credit crunch. But the fundamental problem is obviously that the rates have gone up an awful, awful lot. We're not up to 7% yet. Um, and actually, incidentally, my first mortgage was 7% as well. That was in the early 2000s. Um, but, you know, before we indulge in kind of nostalgia about how great it was then, uh, we'll just kind of carry on with what's happening now. But, you know, they've, uh, you know so your average kind of two-year fix, you can get like 5.8%, I think, in one of the best buys. But that is so much higher than 18 months ago. And, you know, at the end of the day, you know, the, the kind of house prices are dictated by how much people can borrow in order to pay for them. Yeah. Um, and so, you know, if, 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 this, if interest rates have gone up this much, it means that buyers can't afford to borrow as much, which means they can't afford to pay the prices that sellers want. And at the moment, we're seeing a standoff in the market because of that. And that's why kind of housing transactions have dropped off quite significantly compared to last year. Um, now, how that resolves itself, okay. you know, we can wait and see. Well, I'll tell you how it resolves itself in one fell swoop. It's on Zoopla. Price has been knocked down on the same street I lived in 1994 by anywhere between 4% and 14%. Value to be had, John Stepick, and that is SW6. You can IB me for the details. Up next, Bloomberg Surveillance. The early editions up next with Critty and Guy Johnson on Bloomberg.